Maybe you've experienced it, an increased heart rate, a trembling hand, breathlessness, a feeling that you're out of control. Maybe this is how you feel all the time because of a gripping phobia, a fear of what might happen. Well, you're not alone. Fear has kept so many people from stepping out in faith to pursue a dream or find their life's purpose. Today on State of Independence, I want you to meet someone who seems to have made a career out of facing fear and embracing whatever challenge was placed on her path. Don't miss this conversation. Her father was a Pittsburgh steelworker who, together with her mom, set high expectations for a young black girl growing up in the years before the promise of civil rights was fully achieved. She was first a public school teacher, then a respected common pleas court judge, and in 2007 was elected as the first African American woman to be elected to the Pennsylvania Superior Court. After she retired from the bench, Judge Cheryl Allen became of counsel with the Pennsylvania Family Institute and the Independence Law Center, organizations that work on behalf of life, family, and religious liberty issues. We're so honored to have you, Judge Allen, joining us today from her home city of Pittsburgh. Welcome, Judge. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. No, well, what, what a great story you have. It may not be apparent to people because they see you and, and they, they know you as a judge. They, they know that you've had an outstanding career, yeah, but, but they, they, don't know, they don't know how you got there. I'm, I'm sure when you were a kid growing up uh, that there weren't a lot of, of, of women, let alone black women, who were headed into law. So, so how did, tell me, tell me a little bit, tell all of us a little bit about your journey and how you come from this wonderful family in Pittsburgh to end up going to law school. Well, when I was growing up, I never envisioned myself as a lawyer or a judge for that matter. Um, when I graduated from high school, I enrolled at Penn State University. And one of the first things that happened to me was you they say gave that in such a matter of fact way. You you obviously <laughs> have to have great grades to get into Penn State, but 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 well, go ahead. Not necessarily. <laughs> it's a state related university, and um, I became a freshman there in 1965, <laughs> and um, I was given an aptitude test. And I always I never really believed in those things. And when the test results came back. Um, the results stated that I was best suited for a career in law, a career in counseling, and a career in ministry. Well, I kind of laughed at the ministry part of it because I had a lot of ministers in my family and wasn't particularly interested in that field. And I didn't have any problem envisioning myself as a school counselor but lawyer seemed to be a little bit out of my reach. I did not know any lawyers, black or white, male or female. And interestingly enough, no one uh, at Penn State, my counselor did not, no one encouraged me to consider law as a career. And at that time, I did what most women did of my generation, especially at Penn State. I became a school teacher. And it seemed that, as, as I look back on it, is that what they could? Almost, is that what they encourage you to do? Is that they said did they encourage you to go into education as a school teacher? Not really, but they didn't encourage me to go into law. And education, school teaching, social work, nursing, um, journalism, just about everybody I knew at Penn State was in one of those four fields. All the women, and um, so I became a school teacher. And I taught school, I taught second grade for three years in the Pittsburgh public schools. And I really enjoyed my work as a teacher, but halfway through my third year, I just could not see myself doing that for the next 30 years. And at that time, um, this was after the assassination of uh, Reverend Martin Luther King and many of the law schools had started really opening their doors and actively recruiting black students at the time. And so I was fortunate enough to get into Pitt Law School um, 
all expenses paid through the Carthage program. And that's how I became a lawyer. Wow. Did you know what field, what aspect of law you wanted to concentrate on? Since there's such a wide array of, of things you can do in the law, did you know? Well, I, I really didn't know. I just, I, I focused on getting out of law school, which was, <laughs> <laughs> which was not that easy for me coming from elementary education. Uh, I had not taken any pre-law courses, so to speak. Um, so I really, it was difficult, but when I graduated from law school, I started working at Neighborhood Legal Services, which was truly Neighborhood Legal Services at that time. In Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh area, there really was an office in virtually every neighborhood. And um, from there, I worked for the State Human Relations Commission, and I spent the bulk of my legal career working in the Allegheny County Law Department as an assistant solicitor. Uh, I practiced law for 15 years before being appointed, becoming an appointed judge in 1990. What, by what, what, did, what, what did your parents say uh, about this? I mean, was, were they shocked at your at your uh, uh, at the way your career advanced? Were they surprised when you decided yes. to go to a law school? I mean, did, did that shock Absolutely. them? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> they were completely shocked, and um, in fact, they couldn't understand why I would leave my my teaching career right. to become a liar. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my father called them at the time. I, they, they couldn't understand why I would leave my teaching career to become a lawyer. Um, they, they felt that, you know, you're in a secure position right. and you should just stay in teaching. But I, I left, you know, I, I have always been a risk taker and um, I enrolled in law school. And I can tell you about halfway through, or I should say in the first two weeks of my first year, I think I sat down and cried and wondered, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and <laughs> I had to study. I probably studied more in my first year of law school than in 12 years of, than in four years of college. Wow. And 12 years of school combined. Wow. So were, were, were you were afraid? Were you afraid uh, that you might not make it, that you might that maybe you made the wrong choice or that maybe you might not graduate or did at I ever... one point I was afraid that, that I had made the wrong choice. But, you know, once I start something, I'm a pretty determined person. So I had yeah. to finish it, even if it meant going underground, shutting the world out <laughs> <laughs> and focusing entire focusing entirely on my studies. And so that's what I did. Did, did, did your faith uh, come into play in any of this? I mean, the fact that you saw yourself as a Christian person, as a, as a follower of Christ? Well, at that time, I didn't really see myself as a Christian person, which is another part of my story. Um, I grew up in Homestead, the Homestead, Pennsylvania, which was once known as the steel capital of the world. I come from a family of steel workers. And um, I had people in my family who were very, very active. Um, I had an uncle who was very active in the Communist Party. And um, my father was very active and, and, and had those kinds of leanings. And I was drawn to, to, to that at one point in my life. So I was pretty much a 1960s um, 1970s, you know, activists or radical, so to speak, I guess I would be considered now. And um, so my faith was really not a part of my life at that time. So when, 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 did, when, did, when did you come to faith? What, what, what changed it for you? What, I mean, we, we see before us this great judge, <laughs> uh, somebody who, who, who certainly embodies uh, uh, everything that we know about what Christians ought to be and who, who fights for, for, uh, for the values of people who, who, who uh, follow Christ um, in, in the well, law. You know, how did you, you get there? <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. I, I was listening to uh, Costi Hinn speak today and he talked about people choosing Christ and he said, you didn't choose Christ, he chose you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I began practicing law and um, I considered myself somewhat somewhat of an activist at the time. And, you know, and I'm still an activist. 
and I'm still radical. I'm just radical for Christ today. <laughs> but I, it wasn't always that way. I mean, I, at one point in my life, was actually to the left of AOC and Elizabeth Warren. And people find that hard to believe, but it's true. Um, so at some point, um, I would say during my early, maybe just before my appointment to the bench, I had this transformation. Wow. And it was, and I, I can't say that it, 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 I have to say that it was gradual um, to the point where by 2003, um, I, I, I really couldn't reconcile my Christian values with the political aspect of it. And, um, you know, there was just a complete transformation, a complete change, and I can't really explain it. <laughs> It just happened one day. I just, you know, my eyes were open and I saw the world from a totally different lens than I used to see the world. I think that it's fair to say that I've always had this um, yearning to know the truth, to know what is true. And in my younger years, of course, socialism looked or seemed to be more equitable, more appealing just like it, 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 it appears to be that way today to a lot of young people, unfortunately. And I had a lot of exposure to, to people on the left. Um, I became actively in, involved in a national women's organization called Women for Racial and Economic Equality. And be, through, that mem through that involvement, I had the chance to travel a lot um, to, to the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union and to other countries throughout the world through the Women's International Democratic Federation. But, you know, I, I came to learn that man in his fallen state cannot create utopia. And you know, people are somewhat deceived today because they seem to believe that we as human beings can create the ideal society if, if we just make some changes. And that's just not possible. Only God can create utopia. Amen. And so it, it's it's a godless system. And once I, you know, my heart was turned toward my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I could no longer embrace that system. Wow. Wow, that's very, that's powerful. Um, do you still have love in your heart for the people who maybe don't agree with you, but, but uh, who were at one time... Uh, uh, in lockstep with you when you were on that side. Uh, do, do you still have love in your heart for, 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 for folks who, who haven't yet seen it the way you see it? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, my earnest prayer is that their eyes, that the scales would fall from their eyes and they would see the truth also. Um, because so many, so many people today are looking to, especially in the black community, you know, they've replaced God with the government and they're looking to the government to solve um, all of the problems of our community. And the government cannot do that. In fact, the government caused a lot of the problems or, or you know, encouraged a lot of the problems in our community. And um, I find that the further we turn or the more we turn away from God, um, the more trouble we're in and the more problems we realize. Oh, that's well, well, well said. Uh, you, you got to, to, to do something about um, matters as a, as a member of the bench. I mean, you, you got to be a judge. You were the first African-American woman elected to the Superior Court in Pennsylvania. Uh, and and that, that's quite, quite a, an honor. Uh, what a wonderful thing. It's also a, a position of, of great importance where you get to, to opine to make great decisions and, and uh, that affect people. Um, what, what was that experience like for you? Um, it, was, it was a very gratifying experience because the Superior Court of Pennsylvania is probably one of the business busiest, if not the busiest court in the nation. And what people don't realize is the overwhelming majority of decisions, uh, appellate court decisions in the state of Pennsylvania are decided by the superior court. When I was on the bench, we would um, determine at least 8,000 cases per year. 
uh, whereas the Supreme Court might hear two or three hundred at the most, because they would, you know, you you had an automatic right of appeal to the Superior Court, but the Supreme Court, you you, you would have to petition for permission to appeal. And they would only take cases that involved a, a new or novel issue uh, or an issue that had not been decided before or um, something directly related to the Pennsylvania Constitution that needed to be decided. And so most cases, most appeals ended at our with our court. And so in, on the Superior Court, we heard cases involving family, um, civil cases involving uh, personal injury and property, Uh, orphans court cases involving wills and estates, and our greatest caseload involved criminal cases. So, you know, criminal court appeals would usually end with our court. So we were very, very busy, and um, I was blessed when I was on the Superior Court to have a wonderful staff, to have great law clerks that made me look good, (laughs) and a a great staff, and um, that made me look good in the sense that we were able to to run one of the most efficient courts um, offices on the Superior Court. So we never a, had a backlog. So, so we, we were always up. So, so as a Superior Court judge, um, mm-hmm. uh, especially somebody with a with with a, a strong uh, faith in Christ as you have, uh, how do you balance uh, uh, mercy and justice? You know, on the one hand, you have people who have done things wrong, and and, and these are criminal cases. You know, mm-hmm. in, in 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 determining how you will judge them, how 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 did you come to balance mercy and and justice? Well, balancing mercy and justice was more of a function of being a trial court judge, um, especially in juvenile court, when you were able to deal with children and see their needs, um, see some of the things that were going on in their lives that that led them uh, down the wrong path. And you had a greater opportunity to address some of those issues through programs and, and, and counseling and other practices. And the same can be said for criminal court. When you're on the superior court, however, you are basically, we, are, we were basically an error correcting court. You know, we didn't hear witnesses. We didn't take testimony. Um, our function, our job was to correct any errors that might have been um, committed by the trial by the trial court. And so we would either, um, after reviewing the record and some t- and the briefs and sometimes hearing arguments, um, our job was to determine whether a case should be a trial court should be affirmed or reversed or sometimes we would remand the case back to the trial court with further instructions. There were cases where, and, 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 it, and it didn't happen often when I felt that there were some pretty egregious things that happened at the trial court level. And so, you know, we would write and reverse the trial court on those, on those cases with further instructions. But basically the superior court is an intermediate appellate court and we heard cases from all over the state, um, from every county, and we are an error correcting court. Excellent, excellent. When we return, I want to ask Judge Allen to talk about how she was able to fight fear and what did fear look like on the Superior Court. We'll be right back. You're watching Joe Watkins State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. I'm with Judge Cheryl Allen, joining us from Pittsburgh. She's one of the leading advocates for the Constitution and the rule of law. You'll most often see and hear her today working on behalf of issues like the protection of life, religious liberty, and parental rights with her work at Independence Law Center. Uh, Judge Allen, we are so honored, of course, to have you. Uh, Quick question. Um, uh, Your understanding of the Constitution as compared with maybe the the understanding of some others, how how might your understanding of the Constitution have differed from some of your colleagues on the bench? (laughs) You know, I remember um, once when I was running for a higher court 
and I was asked the question by the by the Philadelphia Inquirer, as a matter of fact, and they asked me what I believe was the greatest impediment to justice in our court system. And I gave them a one word answer, and that one word was politics. Um, judges in Pennsylvania are elected, you know, from the district justice level up to the Supreme Court. And I found very often that I would work with people who, I mean, there's a reason why judges are elected for 10 year terms. And there's a reason why judges, uh, once they face the first partisan election, they never again have to face a partisan election. They run for retention after 10 years, uh, basically on their own record. But, and, and, and that reason is because we want judges to be free of political pressure so that they are able to make decisions without worrying about being reelected, um, worrying about offending a particular interest group. But that being said, I, I found that on the bench, politics often still played a major role in how some judges carried out their function, whether it was a ruling on a particular issue or whether it was uh, bowing to the administration or of other branches of government in the functioning of the court. And that always presented a major challenge for me because I believe that as a judge, my role is to uphold the constitution and uphold the law and not bow to political pressure. You know, for example, when I was in juvenile court, um, the issue was always, how do we save money for the county? And, you know, I always took the position that it's not my job to balance the budget off the backs of young people, you know, to appease the, uh, the, the elected officials. And that's probably the greatest challenge that I faced on the bench. Um, yeah, you, 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 know, don't, you don't have fear which is such an admirable thing. I mean, you know, a lot of well, people would say, well, I'm, I'm, I have fear because I care about my job and I don't want to do anything to jeopardize my, my job, my livelihood. So therefore, um, let me take into consideration these other things and protect myself. And that, that has never been your, your, your position. Um, I wouldn't say I have no fear. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm human, but for the most part, I, I, I fear God. Uh, I, I really do. And, you know, my prayer um, before I took the bench every day is that God would give me the wisdom and the discernment and the courage to do what was right. You know, when I look back over my life and I look at all the years where I rejected God and in spite of all of that, he saved me. You know, he, he stepped in and he, you know, really turned my life around. And I am so grateful for what he's done for me that I'm committed to the best of my ability to doing what's right. And so when he delivered me from the sin of my past, he also delivered me from the opinions of people. And <laughs> if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be able to to take the stands that I take. You know, I am fiercely, staunchly pro-life. You know, I believe that that I believe in the sanctity of life. I believe that the um, abortion industry has had devastating impact, a devastating impact on our community. And so, you know, I'm not afraid to stand up and say, human lives matter all human life, because human life was created in the image of God, and it matters. And, you know, I know some people get offended at that, because I'm not supposed to say that. But I try to speak the truth. And I just pray and ask God to give me the courage to tell the truth, to speak the truth, no matter what. You know, we, pa we, we pass through this life, we're here for only a short time. And eternity is forever. And so I try to live my life. I try to do what I believe God would have me do. I try to stand on the truth. Am I always successful? No, because I'm not perfect. 
Um, but, you know, God has delivered me and given me strength and courage to stand. And that's as long as I'm capable of standing, that's what I'll do. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much to our special guest, Judge Cheryl Allen. Thank you, Judge Allen, for your witness to your faith in God and the hope of the gospel. We're so grateful that God is continuing to use you in significant ways for his purposes. And you've made a real difference uh, so far. Uh, can't wait to see what you're going to do going forward. I'll be back with our producer, Jeff Coleman, with closing thoughts. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. And now we'll talk to our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Okay, so here's my takeaway from this. Yeah. Uh, you, you asked the question about how does she have courage? And she says, when he delivered me from the sins of my past, uh, he freed me from the opinions of people. Mm. I mean, that really is at the crux of why we are so fearful in many uh, times about speaking the truth, doing it graciously, winsomely, uh, in love, um, in a way that doesn't destroy or seek to destroy the other person, but still being able to engage truthfully. And you have all of these uh, positions of power where we step in or, or influence, and you're at the moment and you have to, you know, you have a conviction that it's time for you to speak up in a meeting, yeah. at work, when you see something wrong. And uh, the freedom to do that is because God has freed you. Right. That was so encouraging, I yeah, thought. Yeah, well, she said, you know, we only have a short time to be here. Yeah. And she said, you know, and, and she, everybody wants to hear the praise of people, but she said, but, but I fear God. Right. And, and while I'm here, I've got to do what's right. I've got to be honest. It rebalances the, the whole equation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have there been times when, when you have been in that position where you've had to make that decision? Oh, many, sure. many, many times. And yeah. sometimes I've fallen short, let me tell you. Yeah. But God is good and faithful. You get another chance every get, day. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> every day. That's a good show. Yes. Yeah, great, 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 great conversation. Loved it. Loved it. Well, well, that's all the time we have for today's State of Independence. If you're feeling insignificant or unimportant or, or fearful about what lies ahead, remember that God is nearest to those who place their full trust and confidence in Him, like Judge Cheryl Allen. Thanks to my guest, Judge Cheryl Allen, again. Uh, please take a minute to drop me a line or two in the comment box at joewatkins.org to let me know if this program was encouraging to you. They, they certainly helped me and our great team here at Lighthouse TV know that we're equipping you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That's our mission. From America's first capital, Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins. Thanks so much for watching. God willing, I'll see you next week. It's a steel, steel. quiet, yeah. steely courage. And imagine how God took her from where she was to where she is now. Yeah. She didn't even acknowledge God as a younger person, and now here. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.